Good morning, good evening, and afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all and thank you all for joining our today's uh, event, Linguistics in the Age of AI, where we're exploring opportunities for collaboration and innovation. My name is Elizabeth Chikapa, and I'm thrilled to be your host uh, for this insightful session. Um, today, we have an opportunity to explore the world of AI and linguistics with our distinguished guest, Samuel. Uh, together, we'll explore Samuel's journey in AI and his latest projects at the intersection of course with AI and linguistics. We'll also discover how large language models are revolutionizing natural language processing and examine uh, the dynamic collaboration between, of course, technology and linguistics. So before I begin, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you, <laughs> our participants uh, joining from different parts of the world. Your presence here is enriches our discussions today. And throughout our time together, I encourage you all to actually you know, engage with our guest speaker and of course with each other. Um, you know, your questions and perspective will be variable for our discussions today. Um, so I'll also walk you through how our, se our session will be. So we have four main segments. Number one is the introduction where I will introduce our guest, and we'll have an interview segment where I will ask some prepared questions for to our guests. And then we'll also have question and answers if people have you know questions maybe anything related to the topics that we're gonna discuss and anything that they find intriguing um they can ask and and then we'll conclude so that's how our session today is gonna be so now let me introduce our guest speaker samuel He's a graduate student at University of Toronto. Of course, he has a keen interest in phonetics, mathematical and computational modeling of phonological phenomena in African languages. Uh, his work, of course, focuses on understanding how phonetics contribute to building phonological intelligence systems. And Samuel, I have just provided a brief overview about your background, and I'm sure that our audience would love to hear more from you directly. So could you please introduce yourself <laughs> and also share with us how you started your journey in AI and what made you work in AI? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Samuel uh, Olarewaju, or Olarewaju Samuel, that way it's, it's fine. So um, yes, I am interested in linguistics, particularly I'm interested in how um, Linguists can contribute to AI and how AI can contribute to ling linguists. I mean, as a field and as a, as a profession, uh, yeah, both in the industry and in the academia. And why I'm interested in speech is because many African languages are not documented and the ones that are being documented are not well written. So um, if you can deal with the speech part of uh, languages that you can, you can relate with language at the natural or at the basic level. And that is my intuition about uh, no, reasons for um, dealing with speech data. So my journey into AI, I don't know. Well, so <laughs> it's a lot of um, it's a lot of troubles, but I'm going to try to keep it short. And uh, it can be sentimental to uh, to some extent because what works for me might not work for anybody. Uh, yeah, so you might not want to apply what I said directly to whatever you are doing, but you can pick something like maybe wisdom from it, whether it makes sense to you, uh, or whether it resonates with you. So I started um, my journey into AI in 2015, 2014, 2015. Um, then I didn't see it as AI. I was just interested in working with data sets, annotating data uh, understanding data, understanding different NLP tasks alongside um, why, what kind of data we need to feed into machine, for example. So I was really concerned about how much data machine needs, uh, how much data I need to prepare as a linguist, what are the things I need to know as a linguist to really work together with the tech companies. Um, so yeah, I started 
I I volunteered a lot. I remember I volunteered at UBC at the time. So I was annotating speech data set. I was uh, what I was doing was I was annotating uh, the phonological system, the phonetics, the vowel patterns, the tones, the supersegmental and other things of African languages. And then I don't really know what is really going on. What I was curious about is, okay, how do I annotate this? How do I count my annotation? What is the implication of my annotation? So by 2018, I already I was already concerned about uh, the tokens and the types. So I know that the types in my data set are the unique segment that I have that I'm feeding my machines. Then the tokens are the total number of to uh, segments I'm feeding to machines. So the total number of unique segments is the type. The total number of all the sound is the tokens. So I know that if I, for a machine to learn, I need to feed machine types. For machine to learn well, I need to feed machine tokens. So how much of that tokens I need to feed were the things I was concerned with. So yeah, I started as a data annotator. Um, it was rough. So I got my first gig. I got my first gig on Upwork. Um, so I annotated that like 13 hours of audio sound. I was I was still very young then, so I was a bit sharp. I mean, in terms of endurance. So I could go on my screen for around 20 hours without uh without pains, without anything. I was still very young then. So uh yeah, I annotated 13 hours. The pay was really, really small. But I was excited because I, I felt like, okay, yeah, I got something really cool, right? So yeah, I started like that. Um, now in 2019, I was in UI. So somebody told me about Masakani. Masakani is great. Dr. DJ precisely. I really, uh, I want to thank him again for, for giving that opportunity because Masakani really helped me to now stabilize. So I joined Masakani. I saw the papers people were writing. I was busy reading what they, uh, what they, People are writing. I was reading what they're really interested in. I attend, we, Then we used to have like weekly talk in 2020. So in 2020, I I had a course. I, I took degrees. So I had some degrees. I passed from uh, having trained as a linguist at University of Illinois and UI. So I had a degree. I had some courses I took online in artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, yeah, which... I did alongside my master's, which many people were not really aware of it anyway. So yeah, some people might just be reading it for the first time. So yeah, I was doing both things when I was in UI. Uh, so because I wanted to ground myself in data science, in robotics, in artificial intelligence, and also take along linguistics. So when I was done with my program in UI in 2022, in 2021, late 2021 in November, I convocated from the course I was doing alongside in the one I was doing in UI. So yeah, I fell a bit down. So I was down for like a few weeks because it was a lot of uh, rigorous uh, steps and all. So yeah, yeah, I did that. And then, um, yeah, then I have, like I can see some of my people from University of Rwanda. Yeah, so I, I stayed in Rwanda to chat with some of my friends, not really friends, friends. Like, I mean, I had a position there. I was visiting there. I taught natural language processing for linguists. Uh, so yeah, that really helped me to not only feel that okay, what I've been doing might really make sense, but to also apply uh, what I've been doing uh, to linguistics squarely. Yeah, so basically, so I've been interested in machines since 2013. From high school, I loved mathematics, even though I was not a science student, so to say. Um, so yeah, that really gave me the edge, even... Uh, hedging towards uh, other aspects of uh, things. Even though I was not really uh, doing mathematics in university, so I had engineering friends, which really helped me. So all my, most of my friends, the one that I was reading within linguistics, were engineering and computer science students. So I learned programming from them. I started learning Python around that time. I was learning UI, uh, HTML and CSS. I mean, yeah, so yeah, so that really, yeah. I could summarize it in that way. So yeah, it has been a painful journey and a sweet journey too, uh, because uh, people think that you are crazy for doing what they are not doing. Uh, yeah, but um, I mean, so we are here today and maybe a testament to say that, okay, you were not crazy after all. Maybe you were just different from others, yeah.
Wow, that was really insightful. <laughs> yeah, Thank okay. You. So I was also interested. Yeah, I'm also interested to learn. Um, you know, we have the large language models. They have also kind of, you know, revolutionized the natural language processing. And I wanted to understand it from your perspective, how these models have changed the field, of course, from, you know, a linguistics perspective and also their limitations. Yeah, so uh, large language models, uh, they are cool, right? Um, but I think um, th they are good, they are good stuff. They are interesting uh, things to, to see. But from the linguistic point of view, I think they are positive and negative. They are positive because uh, they make generalization about language. Um, LLMs work with language models, so they are dealing with language. And that is where the, that is where the problem uh, lies. Uh, most engineers who work on large language models think that linguistics is not as important as the engineering component of the things. But um, they are making a lot of mistakes because um, machines learn by observing patterns and then it makes that pattern into some statistics and then make some prediction based on the accounting. So for example, how many somewhere can you see before Elizabeth? I can see 30 Samuel before Elizabeth. How many Elizabeth can you see before Samuel? I can see 20. So, okay, I will predict that, okay, there is likelihood that I will see more Samuel after Elizabeth and I will see the other way because this one is higher than that. Okay. So, and that is sort of a thing we do in linguistics. So in linguistics, we, right from our undergraduates, we kind of do this uh, pattern recognition. So they give us a, a data sets to look at and generalize. So, okay. From this data, what is this morpheme? What is this sound? And why is this sound behaving this way? Is it phonemic? Is it phonetic? Is it underlyingly different? Is it uh, that is what machine is trying to figure out? But because we feed machines, I mean LLMs now, because we feed LLMs with random data, we don't really care about how systematic the learning is going on, because uh um, somebody that uses a phone does not need to care about how the phone was coupled. If it is working fine, it is working fine. I don't need to care about whether the chip is working somewhere, whether the brightness is bad, whether the... once it is working and serving my purpose, a phone is good. Most people are concerned about the camera, the speed, and the space. I mean, so you don't know why the space is there. You don't know whether what is really going to... We don't really care, right? So, and that is how LLM is. But a linguist cares about every bit of details. And say, so, okay, if I am learning something systematically, um, what, how am I learning it? To what extent am I learning it? What is generalization, generalization about? And what kind of generalization do I have to make from this particular specific type of input? Because uh, humans learn language and humans use language. And if humans are using language and learning language, then it means that humans have an input to learn from, make generalization, then test the rules, and then back and forth, very similar to the way LLMs are learning. So LLMs are good things. One, they pose challenge to what has been in linguistics. If you ask me that, okay, humans have a LAD, which is language acquisition device given by Chomsky, that, okay, you have a specific, you have a special device in your head that makes computation easier for you because you can, you learn a finite number of sentences, but you can, the rest of your life, use billions of sentences, which you have not learned. But machines have not that kind of lot. For example, LLMs pour out um, their prediction based on what I told you about something like what I showed you that somewhere before Elizabeth or Elizabeth or Samuel, and then how that it's going to say, okay, the one that has this higher number is going to be uh, better than the one that has this kind of a lesser number. Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, that is what I can say about it. So it poses challenges to fundamental questions about what language acquisition is all about. But in the other side of the technical aspect, it does not really show us uh, how humans are actually learning. I, I know some researches are already going on about how, uh, whether machines are learning the way humans are learning, uh, which would be difficult if you ask me because uh, he, babies learn language within a space of one or two years and that takes them billions of years uh, in their lives. So which means that they are not learning everything they use in their 50th year or their 60th year or something like that. So they've learned it right from being a toddler. Um, so uh, basically uh, those are the things I could say about LLM. So they are good stuff, but I think that if their learning is systematic enough, they can be useful for many things. Uh, yeah. Wow. 
That was also insightful. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think I've also I'm I'm learning a lot from you from this discussion. Um, Thank you. So I mean, you've 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 explained about the limitations. Um, now, are there like specific linguistics concepts that you find that could be you know beneficial for for these models to adopt? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, there are there are different concepts in linguistics that. Um, those models could adopt. Uh, so I would start from what machine learning is all about. So machine learning is, uh, is something that has a good correlate in linguistics. So in linguistics, we have different type of uh, theories explaining language acquisition, how children acquire languages, for example, and which rest a lot about on how neural, how learning can be linked, likened to neural analysis. So if you have, um, if you have a concept and you have it's reference. So if you have like boy, and you know who a boy is, um, if you have a word like job, you don't know what job is. A neural network or from the language acquisition aspect says that when you have a word, the word creates a neural connection. That neural connection is like an experience. So that experience, you strengthen it by using that word frequently. Now, if you hear a word that you've never heard before, just like learning happen, uh, just like when learning happen, you look at your neuro, neuron, then you liken that what you were just learning to what you have had in the past, and then you correlate it as, okay, this word, does it make sense? So it takes time to learn such, which is what we do with machines. So now that kind of systematic analysis of how acquisition is happening is lagging a lot in how they train the machine because psych although I know I know there are computational psycholinguists now growing in the field, but uh, I'm sure we need a lot of hands concerning how psycholinguistic correlates a lot with uh, language acquisition in terms of machine learning. Are the theoretical linguistic part of things? I mean, if you like sentence parsing, there are a lot of things that are in how. Uh, LLMs or LLMs engineers are handling many, many in languages that are that has been done in linguistics, but have not been implemented in machine because there is this mismatch between linguists and uh, engineers. One, many linguists feel that the engineers are not listening to them. Two, many engineers think that they don't really need much of linguists because uh, if we can get the data anyway, and it is doing what it's supposed to do. Why should we care, right? So because there is this mismatch, linguists will do something that's supposed to be an input to what LLMs are doing. Uh, they're not going to implement it. So for example, uh, there are different concept semantic theory. I'm not a semanticist, but there are different meaning theory that have been in linguistics for donkeys of years. Before you have the CBAO and whatever Bayesian or whatever thing we have in LLMs. Um, which had been even before the advent of generative syntax or generative uh, linguistic, which is now what we do mostly around the world. Um, but these theories are lagging in LLMs. If they are not, then we should have we should have a step ahead, not a step behind. So they reinvent the wheel, and um, they they assume that linguists don't really know what they are doing. So because the field linguists don't know what they are doing, we just do it our own way. Like I know uh, CMU has a dictionary of words that map tokens, phones, and phoneme and stuff like that. This has been in linguistics for, for donkeys of you, at least from as far as I've read. You don't have to create a dictionary from scratch, for example. Perhaps because the resources are not available online, I can agree that that is part of the problem because Many linguists don't really care about the digital stuff, especially those one in down south. I mean, those one in Africa and stuff like that. We don't, there are little of our works online, but these guys are working, right? I know, I know you hire has a lot of resources. I know many universities have a lot of resources that are dying in their libraries, but they're not online. So sometimes when these guys just check online, they don't see it. To make their work faster, they just cook something up and then that was it. And then, um, since it works, I mean, if the if you if you're writing a code, there's a simple principle I learned from my teacher. If you write a line of code, if it works, leave it. 
whether it is wrong or right. Since it is working, just leave it, okay? So, um, yeah, so there's this kind of a mismatch between linguistic interest, LLM interest. So the, the, the concepts are not overlapping as you would expect them to be overlapping. Yet, they all claim to be dealing with language. So LLM engineers are dealing with languages, linguists are dealing with languages from different point of view, which is understandable, but then there should be a form of overlap between the concepts. Like um, what I'm interested in, I'm interested in uh, if we speak, there are different things that happen when we speak. We can delete sound, we can add sound, we can we can uh, change the feature of a sound. Everything boils down to what you hear in the long run, right? So if you have this, the mental properties of the sound of a language, and I'm speaking it to you, there is a way I'm going to be reducing, just to fill in the prosody of that speech I'm making. If you are building uh, a, phonolog a phonologically uh, high intelligent system, um, you would need to consider how what I'm saying is perceived by the machine and how the machine is learning it. So I'm interested in how phonetics is feed into machine to make machine build uh, an intelligent system, which we build from childhood. Okay, so it's an interface between phonetics and phonology. Um, so because of that, uh, we, we see a break between what phones are there I know there is there is a there is there is a particular project I read Allosaurus Allosaurus project tried to pick like tokens it does I'm not sure it works like whisper like the the traditional whisper but it takes it takes a token and just uh, make predictions like the force alignment and stuff like that they are cool concepts they are cool things but they are not really really implementing for example what are the features of this sound I know that when I delete so that when I when I change a segment in my speech that segment everything is not deleted. I retain some. Uh -huh. So when I retain some, I change it to be like a neighboring segment. Uh, these guys don't care. I mean, when I give machine, it's telling me this thing and that is all. So um, as basic as phonological processes, they are not implemented. Like John Ohala said in one of his paper, uh, when he was talking about phonetics, phonology, and how the, the vowel harmonic patterns and how they influence a speech recognition system. He, 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 was lament, he lamented in that paper and said, okay, we, we know that uh, the different vowel harmonic patterns that we find in different languages are as a result of this, uh, this speech mismatch. So uh, it can be omelets that as people, as German scholars would call it, it can be a variation in the vowel system. The variation in vowel system is registered in machine as single or same vowel. Whereas a linguist know that it is this same vowel that is becoming that at the surface level, which is this at the underlying level. So you have this mapping between these two uh, sounds. So, but machines just pick them and say, okay, for example, uh, in Yoruba, you can say uh, EJ, that is blood. Then you can say EJ, that is seven. So the AA and the AA -A are not just occurring in random. I know very well that the, the one of the A predict why I have the second A there because they must be together harmonically. They must harmonize by the morphomorphemic uh, words. So, um, but LLM's engineer will pick that and pick that as a different set of words without considering whether there is a root, which is called root controlling or dominance uh, in the sound patterns. So I can go on and on uh, to explain different mismatch between what linguists are doing and what LLMs are trying to do. Uh, but I think that we are making progress. So we are making progress. I believe that by in like a decade from now, there'll be a lot of uh, interesting stuff coming out from both feeds because there, we're having many more computational phonologists, many computational statisticians, many people interested in computational modeling of uh, uh, phonological system and whatever aspect of linguistics they're working on. So yeah, I'm optimistic that um, things is gonna change, but I think at this point, uh, fundamentally we are still uh, not sinking. So linguists are not collaborating with LLM engineers because uh, I mean, you think I am not relevant and then you think, I think you are relevant, but you are over, over relevancing yourself in a way. Uh, you are not over relevant, stuff like that, yeah. Uh, so um, that is just uh, what I can summarize. Um, I don't want to stretch it too much, but I'm I'm happy to to take uh, further questions if there are. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have a few more. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I mean, like, I was learning from your background, you know, linguistics, and now you do AI. 
like I want to understand like are there like additional skills needed for people who are like let's say in our group who are linguists and they would want to also work and you know with models so are there specific skills that are required yes um there are I'm not sure there are any special skills the point would be that I'm going to try to rephrase that question to say that, okay, where do I start uh, as a linguist, for example, uh, wants to go into AI? So I, I read Yoruba, I read Igbo, I read Swahili, I read linguistics or English and stuff like that. So how do I really start? So I, it, you, you don't really need anything special to start. You only need to understand what you want to do. For example, if you are a trained language student, you know how to undo data by impulse because you can't but deal with data when you're in linguistics. For example, your phonemic analysis, your syntactic analysis, your whatever analysis you are trying to do, everything is what machine is trying to do, but machine is trying to scale it. So for example, if you are working on a corpus of 1 billion tokens, it will be difficult for humans to look at the, each sentence and begin to do analysis. But you can teach machine to do the analysis and then get the feedback and then you know do your whatever thing prediction you want to make out of it. But you feed the machine with what you want to do. So to start, you want to start with okay, what is my role as a linguist in AI? So what is my role as if I read linguistics? What can I do? I mean, without any skills, without any technical background. What can I do? You start with data. That is how, that, was, that, that was how I started. So there are different software that we use to undo data in linguistics. If you are dealing with speech data sets, for example, you can use Pratt. With Pratt software, you can annotate text to speech and speech to text. You can annotate spectrogram. You can annotate sp waveform. You can do force alignment, right? If you master how to just pick what you do in linguistics in terms of the phonology and phonetics and do what you're doing with Pratt software, you already started. Okay, you can use Elan. With Elan, there's, there's a software called Elan. Elan is a software that you can use to work on languages that you don't even speak. So there was a time like that, sometimes in 2019, December, I got a geek. I was to work on a language that I don't speak. I'm not going to mention the language because, um, yeah, it's a big tech company. Yeah, so I got that gig and it was, it was really on some pay, right? So I was just travel to that community to do the language. So I was working with engineers, neuroscientists, and like some other people like that. So I knew I was not dealing with this language. So how do I do it that we now pick this data set now and build it into machine, isn't it? So what I did first was I read a lot of articles. I read a lot of books. They were a bit, they were good, but they were a bit confusing. They were confusing because they are not really domesticating it into the African settings where I was. Okay, so I was a bit confused. If I do this in, in an African setting, they're not going to store me. I'm not going to go to an African setting, for example, and just go there and start documenting. I have to talk to some people, see the chiefs, you know, you know, the process involved in language documentation and stuff like that. So um, what I did was to go there. I created my... Uh, base it's called elan database i mean i created a template so in those templates i created uh the source and the targets language and i created how to annotate for each morphemes so when i recorded the data set i started with the word list i recorded the word list i recorded the sentences i tried to understand the grammar of the language it was within like three months thereabouts okay and um, so when i started to understand the data set from my word list. So I moved from what I knew, from what I don't know. So I go, I went from English to the target language, from English to the uh, target language, from English. So English was my source because I don't speak that language. So I set up the tiers in my Elan to annotate the speech for. So I annotated when I, so when I ask you a head in, that, in English, you tell me in that language. I ask you nose, you tell me in that language. I interpreted it, okay? So when I annotated it, I know head, I know, so I annotated the person's voice using the English. So when I did that, I exported that data set, understand the structure, the sound system, 
uh, the vowels, the stuff like that. When I got those ones as my input, then I took it a, a step backward, uh, forward. I collected sentences. So those ones I got, I used them in sentences. And a bit by bit, I understood the grammar of the language. I knew that if I want to train a model, these are the things I'm expecting to be. For example, if you are working in Yoruba language, you know Yoruba language is highly tonal. If you are working in Igbo language, Igbo is tonal. So if you are oblivious of the tonal aspect of that language, you are just dealing with data that you don't even understand, okay? So I knew this language is tonal. I know this language is using grammatical tone, so I can use tone to change the question marks. So I can say something and then I will raise my voice. It's gonna mean question. I will lower my voice, it's gonna mean answer, back and forth. So when the nuances are clear, I just recorded the data set without care without care for whether I'm going to be able to annotate it. So I did, we kind of do this signal processing and just process it uh, using the grammar uh, summary I wrote from what I did as a field linguist. The engineers picked that grammar summary. They understood that, okay, this language is tonal. These are the things in the language. So we know what we are doing. We know what we are testing. We know, I mean, at least we are just like five pages of uh, grammatical summary of the language. And then when they picked that, it, they were, they were, I, I asked them, so was this really helpful? They said, yes, because now we understood the data we are dealing with, even though we don't speak the language. So I collected stories. I didn't translate the stories. I collected many stories. I collected about, for the story, I collected 65 hours. Um, and it was, it was thousands of hours when we were done with the project, okay? So yeah, so that really uh, is another way to start as a linguist. So you see, I, I I worked as a linguist, I went to the field, I worked on a language that I don't even speak myself, and I have explained the process I used to do such. So you have to start with what you have, and then don't be afraid. So that, that's one thing we, we when, when many people hear Python, they say, hey, <laughs> they say Python. Coding, uh, mathematics, and stuff like that. No, 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 no. You don't have to. You, you know, I worked at a company when I when I was at Neurospace. I, I'm not sure I wrote a line of code. I'm not even sure they tested how proficient I was as uh, in Python. I was dealing with data. I was, you know, I was building data set, cleaning data set, and just playing with the data. It was really an interesting time for me uh, when I when I worked at Neurospace, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so, um. I would say I would start from saying, what do I have that I have most have acquired in linguistics that will push me into AI? Okay, so and I've mentioned those softwares. I have mentioned um, um, Elan is E L A N Elan E L A N. So uh, I've mentioned Pratt. So I use AntConk a lot um, to do my pre-processing because you can use AntConk to count the number of sentences in the data set, the number of tokens you have. So every token is the total word. I know that every type is the unique word in that data set. So I know when I, when I, when I filter, for example, by type, I can look at the type of register I have. Okay, well, I'm seeing injection, I'm seeing uh, patients, doctor. Oh, I know this is a medical data set, right? So, I can see, I can see, I can have an overview of the data sets, plot some graphs, see what is going on, stuff like that. So yeah, you can use Antcon to do so too. Which are things we do in linguistics? For example, if you are if you are working on a project and say, okay, what is the probability that somebody is gonna say rice before uh, beans? So if I ask you, what did you eat in the morning? I let rice and beans. That's what people say, right? I let rice and beans because technically if you look at it, beans is always the, the, the smaller portion. And rice is always the bigger portion if you eat rice and beans. So I have this prediction as, okay, if I tell you, what did you eat? You, you will see that, um, you tell me the, you tell me, you arrange your choice by how much you think the quantity is. So if I ask you, uh, Elizabeth, what did you eat in the morning? I can tell you, um, I ate um, beans and yam, for example, or I ate, yeah, or I, I took Coke and bread. So I, it's gonna be like a, a small portion of bread and then a, a very big uh, Coke and yeah. So um, that is uh, how, and um, I could say we can uh, start as a language. So what do I have? I'm gonna mention one last thing, which is syntax. Syntax is very, very important uh, in sentence passing and those three diagram you are drawing linguists are not waste. 
Tree diagrams are meant to pass the linear structure of words. So they show you they are they are like the picture or they are the artificial way of viewing what you are seeing in your head. If I say Samuel saw him, so Samuel saw him. I know that Samuel is capable of having an eye to see and to see him. So there is this particular principle in syntax as to talk about argument structure. Argument structure is another concept LLMs are really, really missing from. I believe that with proper argument structure, we can train a better model. I'm going to give you how I have applied this in my work. So at the time I was dealing with a data set, I wanted to train a model that, uh, that picks a word. So uh, I, I attended a talk by Dr. Doje, we was talking about statistical uh something machine statistical machine stuff about how Yoruba verbs have different uh, nouns. So when I when I listened to that talk, I was reading. So I saw that actually I can apply argument structure to this. So I know that if I have a verb, I can tame sentences from the main verb. For example, if I say C, I know the verb C must take two nouns, right? It must take somewhere, saw him. So you have the noun, the verb, and the noun. So by position, I know that if I have only C as a verb and I label it verb, I can predict that, okay, it is somewhere that must be here and it, this thing must be how it will be seen. If I have it, for example, you cannot have it and then have him, right? So if you have somewhere eight, you cannot have somewhere eight him, right? You can have somewhere eight, pizza or rice or chicken or whatever thing. You can't have somewhere eight house. So if you have the argument structure and you pick the verb alone, you already subcategorized for the type of things that could be around that kind of nouns, right? So if you have a data set and you just picked only the verbs, instead of removing the stop words, I know many people prepose and they remove stop words and stuff. You might not really do that. Immediately you pick the verb you know the things that are really, really important to make a complete and sensible sentences. Other things are predicted, right? So if I have uh, a verb, and if I have a uh, smile, somewhere smiled, going to school is good. You can't find such expression, right? Somewhere smiled, you know, it's only somewhere and then he smiled. So, you know, there's nothing after smile. So I can predict anything after smile will be, you know, maybe additional inter, uh, information, not important to make a sensible or an intelligent sentence in the target language. Okay, so if you are a synthetician, you honest, you can relate better. I'm not a synthetician by by interest, but I, of course I have, I've, I have to deal with syntax as a linguist. You, you have edge, you have edge. I had a lot of people because engineers don't understand what argument structures are. Engineers don't really care. I mean, they are engineers. They are trained to be engineers. You are trained to be linguists. Be a linguist. So don't go to AI to become a computer scientist. That's a wrong approach, right? You should go to AI. AI is like an enterprise. Everybody is there. You see economists in AI. You see biologists in AI. Why don't they become computer scientists? Because they know that at the field, at the market square, it is what you have that you sell. You don't sell what you don't have. So, um... I would just uh, try to put it that way. Thank you so much, Samuel. I've actually also learned a lot. Um, I've picked out more on, you know, having the argument structures is really critical. And also, you know, having a good understanding of the syntax, I think will be very beneficial in training models. I also want to ask, you know, some details about, you know, your understanding on the IA data set and also its significance in the field of natural language processing. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, when I was working on, when we were working on IA, eh, I used to call it IA Yoruba. So um, IA is like wife, so wife of Yoruba. So I used to call it, so they laugh and say, okay, what do you mean? I say, I call it IA Yoruba. So ah, yeah, IA project was, a really good one. I really appreciate uh, Kuwaiya for giving me the opportunity to lead uh, some part of the work um, as I did. So it was really an interesting work. It was really, really an interesting work. When I started dealing with the data, I mean, before from the prompt, before the prompt and stuff like that, before we now, you know, make it prompt and stuff, I, I went online. I was analyzing Google datasets. 
I was analyzing different data sets. I'm not going to mention the company so that I don't, I don't put myself in trouble, okay? Okay, so I was analyzing different data sets and I was wondering, okay, are these people really representing Yoruba language? I mean, are they writing Yoruba? It doesn't, it doesn't look like Yoruba. This is not Yoruba. The problem is that, uh, as I noted in my presentation at IA, there are different technological resources that are not built for Africans. We are only adapting them into African settings. You see them saying that we should create a keyboard. So I was working for a company concerning Apple project at the time, and I was the language linguist, uh, Yoruba linguist. So I was annotating the data set. I was doing different things. But I can't put tones on my work. I can't put the dots of dots. Everything is not intelligible. I can't read this. If you have, if you write letter A and letter S and letter O, it doesn't make any sense to a typical Yoruba speaker because this thing you just wrote can be pronounced in different ways and it's not making sense. Okay. So when I started, I was very, very particular about how that these data sets are not representing what we are doing. It was giving me a headache, right? So I saw BBC, you know, BBC News don't don't mark their works most of the time uh but i know they would have a spot perhaps it's it's a business gig i don't know why they are doing it whatever reason they have um you observe that their data sets are not too marked they don't have the dot at the time they ought, ought to have it in different grammatical problems and these are the data set these big giant companies rely on because they can easily scrape it so i'm sure bbc scholars yoruba scholars i'm aware that they would, I'm sure, not aware, I'm sure that they will know that these things we are doing is not representing Yoruba. So you would have to consult us to really, really use the data set because <laughs> you got to, you got to, to mark it, you got to do a lot of things to data set to make it intelligent. Okay, so those are the things I browse, I just search. So when we had the IR, IR was really cool. I, we, we had the, uh, the people contributing from Nigeria, from different parts of the world. So, it was a significant project because first, it was the first project I would see that I used prompt engineering in, in African settings. That's okay. How do you prompt machine to do what it ought to do? So we have the com prompt and we have the completion. So the prompt uh, is not a big language. And if at prompt engineering nowadays are uh, paying scholars, uh, I've got a gig of prompt engineering that I was not able to do because of some constraints. Okay, so you can do prompt engineering. So what is prompt? Prompt is basically like a question, like a question, like something that needs clarification, something like that. The completion is the answer. What you can call adjacency pair, if you're a pragmatician or a pragmatist, or if you're into pragmatics, adjacency pair is when you have something that needs to complete the other. They are in pairs. They have to go together. For example, if I say, who is the king? Who is the president of Nigeria? So, and then you need an adjacency to make a complete sense of what you're saying. Right. I said I'm right. I said I'm asking a rhetorical question. If I am asking a question, I need an answer. So the question is like a prompt. So you nudge machine to okay. You've learned that the president of Nigeria is Tinubu. So I now ask you, who is the president of Nigeria? Machine will say, okay, from what I have learned, I can see that this is the president of Nigeria. So you look at it. Is this right? If it is right. Is it grammatical? If it is grammatical, the orthography, the diacritical issues, are they taking well taken care of? As we scale through the project, the system became more intelligent. That, in fact, when I was looking at the prompts, you don't have to correct. You just have to correct few things, and they are and they are fine. So yeah, it was multilingual in nature. So it was dealing with different languages, different prompts at the same time. So yeah, it was uh, really good. Although I would want, I would have loved us to do IR speech. So IR speech would deal with speech data set because I know that they neglected a lot of data, a lot of languages and a lot of communities because they were dealing with textual data. As I told you earlier on, I am more interested in speech, not only because I love music, because I love music a lot, not only because I love it, but because I feel that the speech, it's the natural point where my grandfather, for example, that doesn't go to school can deal with machine, right? Because I don't, I just have to talk to you. What do you think when you have a farmer 
in the down south in in the farm in Osho State in Nigeria that can pick his phone and talk to it as a farmer. Okay, I want to sell three tubers of yam. And then the message goes to the receiver and in English or in the target language the person is speaking and say, okay, yeah, you want three tubers. Can you give me five? So they can converse. It's going to give them more uh, opportunity to sell. It's going to, it's going to boost the economy. It's going to do a lot of things to these farmers and a lot of people. People are afraid of going to farm, for example, because of some insurgency and some other issues. These people can do that from the from their house. I don't have to go to the farm to do these things, right? I don't have to travel all around, but I can communicate. So, uh, yeah, these are the things I think are uh, application of AYA projects. And these are the things that AYA was trying to do, but not the speech as we were just doing the textual aspect. So it was really an interesting project. Um, I want to thank everybody that really helped me, especially the people that came on board to contribute. Uh, yeah, they were the... They were the, you know, in Yoruba, they said that um, uh, somebody is your shoulder that does not let this cloth to fall off, right? So, yeah. Wow, that was really amazing. I've also picked up on a lot of things, but I would like to, you know, open the floor for our audience. If anyone has, you know, questions or some qualifications, I think this is now the time. Thank you so much, Samuel. This was really good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand or you can actually ask on the chat. There's another question in the chat. Um, okay, the question is, I would like for our special guest to tell us what he feels about having a linguistic approach to prompts or prompting. We have prompting, okay, we have prompt engineering, right? Can we have prompt linguistics or narrow it down to something like prompt stylus or prompt pragmatics, etc.? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, interesting. So, where I think that is a that is a conceptual problem. Engineering does not mean you are an engineer. Number one, so it's the engineering of the engineering of prompt engineering. It's uh, it's a description. Okay, you are trying to you are trying to engineer or create a prompt. Okay, mm -hmm. so if we search with that now, can we have prompt engine? Can we have prompt linguistics? And that is it. So prompt linguistics, we mean to prompt linguistics. That will be a term. Maybe you are prompting machine to learn linguistics. That that will not be engineering it. So engineering would cover whether you are doing it for linguistics or for stylistics or for whatever things you are doing it for. You are technically doing it for, uh, you are engineering it for different things. So yeah, you can style, you can prompt to style. You can prompt in different programs like I explained before. Um, I'm gonna give us uh, like one or two examples from my experience. So if you wanna prompt, Depending on the project, for example, you want to prompt machine for sentiment. So um, that will be talking about maybe pragmatics. And so, okay, if I say a sentence, is it positive, negative, or neutral? So Sama is a good boy, but he might not want to help. So is that uh, a positive statement or a negative statement? So. When you when you have the prompt, that will be the sentence. Then you have the completion. That will be the answer, whether it is sentiment or no sentiment. So you can check. Okay, as a human annotator, what people call human in the loop annotation. Um, um, if you as a human annotator, you can judge. At least you have more understanding than machine. So if if you think that that is a neutral statement, um, then you you change it if the machine says wrong or right. So that is pragmatic aspect of things. So if you have different styles, for example, you have a prompt that is slowly it moves, to and fro, to and fro, faster and faster. And then you're trying to think, okay, is this a poem or a prose? Machine can machine can, can pick it, right? And then you have to annotate it. So I think somebody is giving a follow-up on our Yes, there's a follow-up. I am talking about linguistics aspect of prompting. E.g., you mentioned a case of tonal languages in which the data set provided lacked tones. So I'm considering at where okay. linguistics can be used to optimize or make prompt process yes. more effective. 
Yes, like in the Aya project, we did something about the tone. So when we add the prompt and we add the completion, if machine has not um, done the right tone, we correct the tones. And then we, 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 we pass it to the machine. If the machine has only the right orthography, we'll correct it. Yes, we, we, we did that. So, and that is how it can be used. So you, you will need to have a response from the machine to prompt the machine. Right. Any more questions? I think somebody raised their hand. Yeah. Something about today, something I don't know. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Baba Tunde Kukola. Uh, I would like to appreciate the organizer in Africa. Thanks for meaning well for us. Thanks for bringing us opportunity. Uh, God bless you. Mr. Samuel, good evening, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I need to appreciate you for, you know, being ready to help anytime. You're always available, responsive. You know, you are doing well for us. You are doing, I remember you had uh, a similar program like this sometimes around last year, I can't remember. I can't remember. I know I joined one of your events like this last year. That's, you know, it was an insight like this for, for linguists. Thank you very much. This is about the Polar from University of Lagos. All right, my questions, sir. You shared some uh, application with us. It's a very good one, because I personally, uh, after studying language in school and having interest in, uh, you know, AI, the, the, the computer side of the language, and these are things you are not being exposed to as a, as a student in school. Then how do I start from? And that's, you know, that's the area of you asking what I, how I need to start as a linguist. I really enjoy that part. And I love the fact that you're able to share some software with us that can at least uh, serve as a background for us in which we can build upon. So for those applications, sir, I want you to, I want to know if they are prerequisites. Maybe they are like they are systematic. Maybe you have to okay learn parts or compare. Maybe when you are when you when you now find your way around that, you move to the next one. And you know, like that, like that, just like the process of uh uh linguistics and learning phonetics, moving on to phonology, morphology, and like that. So all it is what you can do at the same time, or you can just go. Give us like a specialization of what those application does. I think that will help us, and we also have our our, our interest. Maybe we have to focus on some certain ones, and uh, just put some aside for now. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Abatunde. In fact, I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry, I can't even remember whether I did one or two things. I mean, I. But yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you for finding it useful for join to join uh, some of those uh, things. I. Uh, I was doing. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, so to answer your question, I'm going to give you an two insights. So first, from the engineering perspective, linguistic data can be two: the speech and the text. So there are there are images, there are sign, what things you're thinking, but fundamentally there are just two parts in NLP the text and the speech. And that's why I was saying I do, I love to deal with speech data sets. Okay, um, having said that, then you know that when you are working on most NLP projects, you are dealing with um, either speech or dealing with text. If you are dealing with text, you can be using a spreadsheet or Excel, uh, you can be using and Kong that I mentioned. But if you are dealing with speech, you will need to use Pratt. If you're dealing with whatever thing you're dealing with speech, speech annotation and stuff like that, you are dealing with Pratt. This is from a linguistic point of view, okay? Um, if you are dealing with uh, other type of linguistic work, like syntax, sentence passing, that is, I know that is universal dependency and there is SUD. So with universal dependency, you can, Practice how you can do passing, sentence passing for Yoruba, for Ausa, for Igbo. And there are different annotation tasks for such uh, scenarios too. So it boils down to looking at what type of data will I be dealing with 
from the NLP point of view, what are the linguistic levels that correlate with this uh, point? For example, if you are doing phonetic phonology, you are using Pratt. If you are doing morphological analysis or morphological uh, comp computing or lexical computing, I did mention one software, which is Flex. You can use Flex to do morphological analysis, uh, morphing by morphing glossing, morphing by morphing analysis and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so basically it boils down to uh, two things, as I said. What is the data set that is coming from uh, the machine engineers? And the second point is, what is the linguistic level that correlates to this data? So, and I said there are two data, right? Which are the speech and the text. So depending on the project I'm working with, I can be doing the speech stuff, dealing with using Pratt, and I can be doing the texture stuff, uh, dealing with using Antconc or using Excel, depending on what you are doing. Um, or I can be doing a more technical work. Actually, I am looking for a, a, a time when we will do sentiment analysis of speech in African languages like Yoruba. So I have always concerned myself with some things concerning stereotyping uh, uh, regions in Nigeria. For example, I know that when, when a new payment dies, they don't write their expression in terms of their sentiments. You will see them say, Kasa, something like that. So they make this exclamation. And that explanation is correlate to what they are trying to pass across. Uh, a Yoruba person can tell you that uh, uh, if, if I ask you, should I go out? And the person said you should go. You will need to understand the tone in that go to really know whether you are permitted to go or when you go, you are in trouble. Okay. So, yeah. So different sentiments are passed across in speech that are not seen in text. But many, many NLP guys focus on the text and neglecting the speech. So if somebody says, um, uh, if somebody just said, okay, uh, Elizabeth is coming. That is her. She's coming. <laughs> Uh, everybody understands. So, you know, everybody adjusts and we know what is going on, okay? So, I know there are different settings uh, where Africans communicate a lot by speech, a lot by facial expression. Well, there's only a look at you, you know, oh, okay. I mean, I'm going beyond my boundary. Uh, the, the, it's not common in North America. In North America, they, they, they expect you to express yourself, talk about it. I mean, tell me how you are feeling. Africans don't tell you how they are feeling. They show you how they are feeling. They make some sounds and then you understand, oh, I mean, <laughs> something is wrong. Okay. All right. Um, so um I think I'm hope I hope I answered that question. Someone is raising their hand. There's another question from Peter. How I as a final year student, if I want to channel the rest of my study as a linguist into the into this aspect, what advice, procedures, connections, and directions can be followed? That's a question from Peter. If you listen to what I said earlier, and I said that you are already a trained data scientist in code. So you only need to patch it up with some tools to learn how to do uh, different analysis, what data annotation is, uh, what uh, data, how to handle data. Then you move from handling data to understanding, okay, what a machine, what a, what will a machine learn from this type of data? How can I tell machine to learn this kind of a thing? I know there are different platforms. For example, I know Neurospace. Neurospace is a no-code platform. I don't know whether it is still like that. As of 2022, uh, Neurospace was a no-code platform where you can put data set and train machine and train a model on your own. So if you are really looking for uh, a codeless platform, I know there is Neurospace where you can, if you are a linguist, you want to build data set, uh, you can just, uh, go into that, build, you throw your data set there and see how machine are learning. Train your own model and download the model and use it. Okay, yeah. Um, so if you apply that together with what I said earlier on about how you should start with data, implement the software and start to do. Yeah. Right. There's also another question. Uh, Gamaniel. Uh, can career opportunities be emphasized again? Also, for someone who wants to build a career, what courses can be suggested? 
Okay, yeah. Um, there are different opportunities for linguists in this space. So you can be a parallel dataset developer. A parallel dataset is a dataset that has at least two languages, sentences parallel to each other. For example, if I want to build the dataset in Yoruba language, uh, that's it target language. So I can pick English as my source or whatever language I'm working on. I know some people in Cameroon, for example, that move from, from their native language to Yoruba because they are native Yoruba speakers and they speak that particular language. So they're collecting data sets in that particular environment. So um, you can be a parallel data set developer. So if you are developing that, there are different application or machine translation data set, which is called also called parallel data set. So you would have a sentence in Yoruba, for example, you will have that same sentence in English, or you have that sentence in English and you have it in Yoruba. If I said, what is your name? And then in Yoruba, we say, I mean, what is your name in Yoruba? So um, uh, how shall we say, depending on the gender of the person you are talking to. Okay. Um, that is one career path. You can be data set annotator. So you are annotating different type of data sets. So to start with that, you want to understand what are the different NLP tasks that are in the that are in in uh that people do. For example, um they do sentiment analysis, what kind of annotation goes into sentiment analysis, they do part of speed tagging, what type of annotation goes into part of speed tagging, they do name entity recognition, what type of annotation goes to name entity recognition, they do speech recognition, what type of annotation go into uh, speech recognition, and then and different type of tasks. So you pick, okay, which one am I doing? There are different platforms which are easy to, to learn. So like uh, you can have AI, IO annotator, you can have a uh, different type of uh, tagging uh, software that you can use or platform that you can use. You just set up the accounts because you know what you want to do. You just see the tags, you add the tags and you begin to do the uh, annotation. So that is when you are doing uh, distances annotation. You can do speech annotation too. Uh, the speech annotation is basically uh, talking about how you can annotate speech. So what are you annotating in speech? Like I explained to you that we can do sentiment analysis, or should I say pragmatic incorporation of sentiment into African content, content uh, context concerning uh, data annotation, and then how you can engineer it. So as a linguist, you can be an engineer. So an engineer, in this case, we're going to be creating scenarios for developing data sets. I have worked in this role before, and I really uh, enjoyed it. So I work with a company in UK. I would withhold the name. Also, uh, I was basically a data engineer, not in the traditional sense of data engineer, I was in a data engineer and I was creating different scenarios which feed linguists we call uh, paradigms. So in linguistics, we have a concept of feed linguistics. In feed linguistics, we are going into a field to document languages that have not been documented. And when we are doing that, we are doing it in a systematic way because we don't know the language. You're trying to take it a bit of like this scenario I explained about a language I worked on and I work with different fields and I was not working. It was, I was not working. I don't know the language. I don't speak the language. Okay, so um, you can uh, pick that kind of a skill and you understand, for example, I know that you can create data sets, engineer data sets from domains. For example, if I am to... Uh, create data set with a that is between health, right? So I need to talk to a doctor. I need to talk to a nurse. So you go to a nurse and say, okay, if a patient comes here, what would you tell me? Okay, if he has diarrhea, if he has this and this and that and this and that, everything there is domain specific to medical students. If you want to do cultural incorporation of Yoruba concept of culture into machines, for example, you go to the herbalist, for example, uh, you go to um, traditional worshippers and ask them, okay, there is a way you will greet them. That alone is already domain specific because you don't go to Babalo, for example, and greet him or her uh, good morning, for example, depending on where you're meeting or when you're meeting the person, the person is going to require some kind of domain specific type of greeting, which already starts your data set. I have done this before in Olukumi community, so I 
I I got into the community trying to document different aspects of their languages, and then I got to know that okay, their greeting system is actually not what you see in a typical Yoruba settings. It is clan based. So there's a way clan A will greet clan B, there's a way clan B will greet clan C. So learning how to greet in itself and telling them to tell you about the greeting systems already domain specific, right? So as a linguist, I understand different domains and different registers. I know that when I'm talking to a teacher, the teacher in the school settings is going to be using different terms that are in the school settings. Okay, so um, you can be an engineer in that aspect. Okay, you can be a prompt engineer. So now in prompt engineering, like I explained now, you are dealing with what machine is giving you. So machine has created the question and the answers, and then you you can you can be evaluating it. Most of the time, that's what we do in prompt engineering, or you can create the prompt yourself. So you can create the prompt and say, okay, uh, who is the president? Who is President Buhari, for example, from Nigeria, or who is the Congolese president, or who is the president of uh, whatever country you are thinking, and then you write the completion. You pass it to machine. You write the complete, you pass it to machine. Machine begins to learn, okay, this is the tone, this is the grammar, this is the question, this is, it begins to learn everything and the completion. And then, I mean, so, these are the kind of tasks you can do. Um, I mean, there are different opportunities. And then you cannot be an independent freelancer, which is what I did sometimes in 2020. Uh, I was uh, I was developing data sets. So there are different platforms you can develop data sets and you can sell those data sets. So if you if you check online, there are data place, that data marketplace. So data marketplace, you can develop data sets translate them and send them out. So, but when I was in this domain of work, before I left doing that, I, I figured that there are some niche that sell faster. For example, if you are translating uh, data sets in health, you sell faster. In finance, you sell faster. In telecommunication or technology, you sell faster than a casual data set like, uh, what is your name? Where are you going to? Sometimes people can use machine to to do deal with these things. But those core technical aspects of things are really lagging behind in all these uh, LLMs. Um, yeah, so that's another thing you could uh, do. Uh, I hope I'm able to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. I oh, okay, there's another follow-up question. Please state some of the freelancing <laughs> platforms where people would want, I think, to, to be independent freelancers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so... I know there is Taos Data Place, Data Marketplace. I know there are uh, there is Kili Data Place. There are different data places. Just browse Data Marketplace. You would see tons of them. Create an account, put your details, bank details, and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. Is that is that simple? Thank you so much. Are there any more questions? Oh, there's another question, actually. In your opinion, are there job prospects who hires annotators, prompt engineers, ETC in African languages? That's a question from the chat. <laughs> yes. And uh, there are different links. You can just browse data annotators positions, data annotation freelance position. You would get a lot. So I must admit that if you are in this kind of space dealing with different data sets, the number of languages you know will pave way for you. For example, someone that knows Yoruba alone and English may not uh, uh, may not be able to may be restricted in terms of the gig they get compared to someone that do like French, Swahili, Yoruba, and English. You know, so sometimes the your your language combination tells a lot on how much you make and your, your, how much you, how frequent you get job. Okay, so there are different tricks we use. So I'm gonna give you one trick. Uh, at the time when I was still an undergraduate student, I was dealing with data sets that I didn't speak the language. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a rough journey, okay? So don't try it. <laughs> okay, um, so what I do was, what I did was to, I, I, know, I know some Beninese, in my school. So I collected data sets in French. <laughs> I hired them in dollars. I collected it in French and I hired them in, I paid them in Naira. So yeah, it was really cool gig, but I felt like I cheated them. So uh, I I regretted doing it 
later, but um, at that time I thought I was enjoying myself. Okay, so I yeah I collected that data set from. So that's what you can do, but you don't have to cheat them, okay? So you can just collect the data set. If you're in the annotation platform, the person will talk to you in English. Um, they are dealing with language that you don't know. So you can just go online. So something that I do is, if I am in a place that I don't have people, so I just go on Facebook, I can search for community and say, uh, uh, equate people in Nigeria, equate community in Nigeria. I know equate language is spoken in Sparako because I'm from Nigeria. But if I'm from other countries, that's what I will just search it. I will check that that group and pick one or two people there and begin to chat to them one after the other. Okay, I have this job and I want to do it. Um, can you do this? Can you do that? And I've, I had people from there and I paid them well. And it really worked well again and again, win-win, okay? So that is another thing you could add to that from my experience. Um, yeah, I hope I'm able to answer your question. There's another question as well. Okay, how possible will it be to get so many other languages data that you don't speak, not familiar with, and have never heard of it, and has no available data online for analysis? Nice. Um, so I have explained the possibility. I said as linguists, we work on languages we don't even speak. Linguists don't have to speak a language before they work on it. So in that regard, what we do, what I have done in the past is, uh, depends on where the language is spoken. So I hire language consultant or language specialist. I go with my word list and my sense, of course. And so I start with collecting the word list and the sentences. And then I reach conclusion about the language. I begin to write the grammar. Okay, in this language, you have this kind of syllable structure, you have this number of vowels, you have this number of consonants, you have this number of sound, this one of phonological processes and stuff like that, that could inform uh, language engineers. Every feedwork output is data set. So I'm gonna repeat that. When you are documenting languages, your output is automatically a data set. So you don't have to create another type of data set if you were a linguist involved in language documentation, because the output of language documentation is corpus, which is what we call data set. So um, merely being a linguist already made you uh, that kind of person that developed data set for a language that you don't speak. Yeah. So I have explained it earlier on on how I did something like this for a language, a gig I got, and I worked on a language that I don't speak. Thank you so much. I don't know if there are any other questions from our audience. Okay, yeah. Looks like there are no more questions for you. But this was really actually very insightful and truly enlightening. Uh, personally, I've learned a lot and um, I'm hoping that others have as well. You know, especially, you know, when you're looking at opportunities for linguists in the career, I think you've really provided guidance on you know, what people could concentrate on, what subjects, courses to, you know, and how to actually also work around, like, okay, in terms of career direction, prompt engineering, data annotate, and to be a data annotator, or you can be a, a, a freelancer. And you've also provided, like, you know, examples of, you know, those kind of data marketplace where people would actually go and look for that. That was really, really insightful. And I would also want to thank you for sharing your expertise and experience with us. We don't take it for granted, Samuel. <laughs> of course, and your passion for linguistics and dedication to the field is truly inspiring. Um, I think there's another person who is saying you've really answered all their questions and they're thanking you for that. Uh, but I really also want to appreciate uh, my gratitude to all of our participants today. I think you provided really good questions. They were really thoughtful questions. And it was really, you know, active participation and engaging and reaching. And from your questions, I think others have also learned from that. Um, and yeah, that's that from me. <laughs> Looking forward to another conversation uh, with all of the team here. And but this was actually very good, Summer. So thank you so much for your time. <laughs> thank you and i know there was there was another thing about the recording don't worry we we'll actually uh we are aware of that and i think majority of you we already have your your email so 
work around that. We'll alert you once we have the recordings ready. We'll make sure that all of you get it. Yeah. So that's that. But otherwise, thank you all for your time. Uh, please, um, I want to. Held again. So it is very interesting and inspiring. I want such like this um, to be held again so that um, at least uh, we have many linguists uh, around the world mm. preserving language and then Jamit. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you too. Nice. And also we do have a feedback form and would really love for all of you to actually, um, you know, help us in filling that out uh, so that we can have more suggestions or from you. We would love to get, you know, different topics about, you know, linguistics and areas we'd want to learn from. That way would actually make, you know, this kind of sessions that actually are uh, very narrowed down to what you need. So we'll actually have a, and we'll email you about the feedback bit feedback form and please make sure you fill it up because it's gonna really assist us in planning further meetings. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. We'll be expecting to see the forms. All right, thank you. A very insightful and thought-provoking section. Thank you, God bless you. Thank Lisa you. And, and um we we'll really enjoy you. Thank you, thank bye. you, Simeon. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for organizing this uh, session. We really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>